Stanford University. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for not going on the tour. Um, but this will be more interesting. It's going to have a very um, exascale flavor to it. So I work at Oak Ridge. Um, we have a decent sized cluster with like 220 something thousand cores. And we care about performance. And performance is like the major thing. So we have to get science done. Um, so I, you know, I lead an effort which has um, a few collaborators at universities and um, other national labs and now a few other um, small businesses. <clears throat> so I'd like to give an outline of my talk and I really want to talk first about some of the challenges because when I'm hearing, you know, some things scare me when I'm hearing like, you know, there's going to be no like storage besides what's just on the node which is like, um, I don't understand how that will work for our cases, but I, I'm here to be educated. I'm trying to listen, and I'm finding like I'm around lots of database people, which is kind of scary for me because I don't really know too much about databases, but I'm here to learn, and I'm here to try to figure out what would make sense, what can we use from your guys' technologies, and perhaps what are some things that we're doing that could actually penetrate into some of your ecosystems. So one of the things that we've done is create this I.O. system called Adios. And we, I guess we released it at um, about two years ago from now. And about 30% of all the time at the Oak Ridge um, Supercomputing Center is actually using our I.O. system now. And typically, they're using it because nothing else would work well for them. In other words, they can't get their science done at scale. And I'll explain what this is. And then SOA, where I'm like, hold it, how am I? You guys don't know what SOA is, really? I mean, service-oriented architecture? I mean, I thought you guys would know that. I mean, usually, like, I say what that is. But I'm like, oh, this audience would absolutely know it. But OK, fine. Um, and then, of course, you guys know what in-transit approach means, um, assuming. So we want to operate on data as it moves. So there's a lot of terms in situ, in transit. I'll use those terms interchangeably. There's co-processing. We're trying to really abstract things to make it all the same. And you know, I'll go into a little for future work. And you know, since somehow I got magic time here, you know, I'll actually show some of our publications just because I'm used to more academic talks where I'm supposed to show. But you know, I will, I'll go through those so fast you won't even have to pay attention. So right now, you know, our work is supported under the um, Office for Advanced Scientific Computing Research. Um, I'm on many scientific applications for fusion and now combustion through our co-design project, where what we're trying to do is design the next generation exascale architecture, where we have to now worry about like energy, and we have to worry about like how to get science done. And one of the things that the program manager keeps telling us is, we can't write to the file system. Avoid doing I.O. at all cost, which you guys would love, right? And one of the reasons you know, is because, you know, again, they're going to put money in a particular place. Flops is like the main thing. It's sexy for the people in HPC. You know, no one cares about IOPS. We never heard IOPS mentioned around us. You know, if you ask people what IOPS is, that's like asking you, you know, perhaps what is a particle and cell code and tell me the gyrokinetic equations. You probably can't say that. They probably can't say what an IOP really is. So let's continue. Okay, I was pushed twice for whatever reason. Okay, so this is the typical roadmap that we face. And let me see, laser button was middle. All right. So this is a typical top 500 chart. This was at least from the other year. Now the US is number three. Um, so Japan and China have now beat us, but we're trying to get back. This is the fastest computer. This is the sum of the 500s. And what do we see here is that we're on this linear trend on this log log plot. And we're, uh, we're always trying, or well, log linear plot, but we're always trying to get more flops because what we're trying to do is simulate mother nature. And you know, that's really complex. 
think about all the scales. Think about from quantum effects over to these very large time effects. It's extremely difficult, and because it's extremely difficult, we need lots of computing power. As we go from our simple models over to more like first principles approaches, the computing power that we need is vast, meaning zettaflops will not help us out even. So we always make different approximations, and the approximations, of course, you know, we have to take care of, and then we have to look at our data, we have to validate our data, and the hope is that we can do a lot of predictive science. So we have lots of flops, but there's problems that we face when we have big systems. And you guys know all about it in terms of performance. We need to get really good performance. Now we even have to be energy efficient, but we have to care about resiliency. I mean, how do I run off of, say, a million cores and a link goes down or a node goes down or, God forbid, some software, which, I mean, it never happens, especially with Lustre. But, you know, just suppose something happened and, like, Something goes down, and now I have to restart. There's going to be communication. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to use different nodes. I'm going to have now a new node that will replace an old. Data will be moved. Data will be coming in from either a file system or other places. So we have to have fast network. We know problems are getting a lot worse. And in fact, when we track actually I.O. and what, you know, how the value of this is towards HPC, we know that on ASCII Purple, it was a big machine over um, not that far from here in Livermore. It had 49 terabytes on the system, distributed memory. They were able to get 140 gigabytes per second. In the US so far, we're still like 200 gigabytes per second, roughly, with roughly 300 terabytes. If you look at that, you know, this is like a long period of time. We've gone down in this period of time. I think it was seven year period or five years. So we've actually gotten worse of how fast we can write. Now, of course, no one is stupid enough to think that we're going to write like raw memory. Applications know what they need in order to restart. They'll do their own restart. So everyone writes a restart now, or actually on Oker's machine, it's like get off because you're not going to be able to actually run for 24 hours. And we've had lots of people coming to us. I want to run for 24 hours, and they don't have a checkpoint. And then they complained to us, the system went down. Like, yeah, it went down in the hour, we told you. They're like, well, we want a refund. I mean, that's the typical things we hear. Well, the other thing about this is that, you know, we have this whole system mapped out to 2018. That's the magic number of exascale. If you guys don't play in exascale, now 2018 is really 2020 from what I hear, but we'll just still call it 2018. And the thing is, the I.O. is not getting better, but they want 20 terabytes per second. Now, 20 terabytes per second, that's a pretty awesome number, but you have to understand that that's coming, and if you look at the concurrency, we're talking about this huge concurrency. 50 gigabytes per second is the interconnect bandwidth, and we have large amounts of memory. So we have huge amounts of memory. We're going to be running across. We're going to have 300 petabytes of storage on the one system. Hopefully it's not shared, but you know, some people want it shared. And now we have to deal with it. The thing is, right now on today, people get really surprised. I look at codes running on the three different large computing resources over in the DOE centers. Very few people can get greater than five gigabytes per second. When I mean very few, I mean it's like rare. There's papers published. I got my five gigabytes per second, okay? There's papers in 2010 which show like HDF5, they were able to get five gigabytes per second on our machine. Well, you know, we're saying it's like 200 gigabytes per second. There's obviously a disconnect here. So what are some of the challenges that we're gonna face? Well, we have on the architectural level, we have deep memory hierarchies coming in. So we have memristors, we have phase change memory. We need to abstract that away so that the physicists don't have to understand this. Because, you know, you'll see I have a lot of picture of, like, different apes. And there's a reason, you know, if you understand, like, everyone I work with. I mean, they want things really easy. But, you know, we have things like, well, we have to understand. Majority of the codes are Fortran. That's 77. They're still trying to get up to Fortran 90. Okay? Now, there's reasons. Again, speed. 
Fortran 90, most of the compilers are not as good. In fact, you had to take away from Fortran 90 to make it more Fortran 77 in order to get your speed. When you're charged for time, you have to do these things. So we have other things, okay, at the system level, we have different things like I.O. rates and volume stresses for the interconnect, and it's going to limit the application performance. And we have huge amounts of power that we have to worry about. <coughs> and the other thing is that we have this whole potential for an uneven workflows. We have different codes, like um, the other day we heard the, about the AMR code. We have lots of different AMR codes. We have different amounts of data from different processors, multiple people running on the shared resource. Hotspots can develop. We have to really be able to avoid congestion. So again, I work with a lot of applications team. I, I used to spend 75% of my time on you know, in the day working with applications or being one of the application scientists. And then somehow I got transformed into some form of computer scientist. It's like this Frankenstein experiment. Now I'm a computer scientist, supposedly. And now I spend probably 25% of my time working with the applications. But actually, it's really fun. In fact, the conference call I had today was with our co-design project with Jackie Chen from Sandia. And we're really talking about you know, designing next generation combustion engines and how do you do this efficiently. The other, you know, the other you know, pictures that you'll see are mainly from Fusion. Kwan Lu Ma had one. Actually, one of the things I found out was, you see, that's my last visualization ever until I, you know, I gave Kwan Lu my visualization. That was actually in a movie. The Wall Street, you know, money never sleeps. So I'm like, oh, you know, it made the UT Patel annual report. So I'm like, okay, I went out with a bang, good. Hopefully when I retire, you know, something good will come out of my work and you know, people will see it in a movie. But, you know, and then you can put a Netflix, right? I mean, but the whole thing is that we have lots of time. Actually, our time increased recently because we just got some new users, so I say. We have different applications that are using our system. And it's really interesting when you actually deal with the applications and hear like their big things, what they want. And what do they really want? Well, they want fast I.O. and they want low overhead. So here's one thing, we have to checkpoint. Well, our system, we have failures. Anything large is gonna have failures. We have high levels of concurrency. We don't want I.O. more than 5% of our time. It's kind of this rule of thumb that I came up with like 10 years ago, and most of the apps I work with, they really try to hear 5%. So you can look at, if I have 3,600 seconds in an hour, 5% of that can be used for I.O. if I do synchronous, then you know how much time can be spent in I.O. And then you can say how fast I need to write. And, it, and trust me, when you're trying to write, say, 20 terabytes every hour, and you're only getting one gigabyte per second, that's not good. You're not gonna actually be able to do your science. So lots of problems with that. So the other thing is that, you know, people always talk about simplicity. They want things simple. They want it simple. No one I work with actually understands anything about SQL. I mean, that's like way above. I mean, we've tried it. Many people have tried it. It just doesn't seem to work. I don't know what the disconnect is, but it just doesn't work. But they really want things simple to use, and then they want self-describing file formats. We live in a community where we do files. We move files everywhere. So small portions of data get moved from point A to point B. I need to learn, if I had a database and now I move, how do I move information in and out quickly? How do I now operate on that? How do I get all my data, metadata? So in our system, every single variable, and variables are like pressure, or temperature, or entropy, very simple thing. Everything is what we call characterized. We have statistics for everything. We have min, maxes, et cetera. And now we're using technology, we're integrating technology like FastBit that you know, we have one guy here working with, that we're integrating it so we can actually query our data quickly and trying to come up with efficient queries. So this is important. And the other thing is quality of service. Another thing that's very annoying for users I'm writing or reading from the system. Now I'm writing my 10 terabytes. I think it's going to take 10 minutes. All of a sudden it takes, I don't know, 10 hours. That's not a good thing. And in fact, this occurs. All the variability occurs. And these things always will occur as you get larger and larger scale. 
So trying to deal and cope with that is very complicated. But then when we talk to our users, we have other things which they call extras. They really would like to do in situ or in transit visualization. You know, it would be really nice if I can see what's going on. I don't want to run 24 hours and not. So what's the typical way scientists do now? They actually run this thing called GNU plot. Did anyone ever run GNU plot? Yeah, okay, I see some of you guys. So imagine you're running on the biggest computer in the world, and the way that you check your calculation is that you have this little ASCII file that has a few columns that only you can understand, and you do GNU plot, you know, and you say plot with lines, you tell the columns, you check the curve, and you say, hmm, that looks fine. Okay, energy, hmm, not being conserved, and then you can kill it. So we really need to add better ways to visualize, because XY plots for this very complex data is probably not the best thing to do. The other thing is that we're trying to couple codes together. As I said, we're trying to model, model Mother Nature. In our fusion experiments, we have MHD effects, we have kinetic effects, we have edge, we have core, we have all these different types of physics. We want to couple it. And by the way, we want to couple it with an I.O. framework or something that looks I.O. because it's all about data movement. So we want to do all these things. We want to perform in, tr in transit workflows. And we developed this system called Adios, which is a modular framework. And really what it is is a way that we have extracted I.O. so you have an optional, we say, XML file. So you describe your data. And you just say, I have this variable, I have this variable. And you can describe how the data is laid out amongst the processors. Now again, we're dealing with lots of people who can't really understand XML, so we tried to make it so that you don't really feel that cost. So a portion of our time is actually spent with some people trying to actually make it so that they give their ASCII text, we convert it to XML by putting like these little brackets and around things that somehow they don't seem to like get that you know, there's these things called tags. But you know, we do that. Now the thing is, one, you know, about our system, we actually have these things called different methods. So we can do different I.O. methods, the way we write to storage, differently. So some people may work one file per process. That may work best for them at a certain scale. Then when they get larger, you know, let's just say certain file systems don't like when you have 100,000 opens. I mean, that can take a little bit of time, maybe like a few hundred seconds which would then violate the 5% principle. So then we try to do other things. So we do asynchronous opens, we thread opens, we do all this stuff, but you can choose your different methods. So when one thing doesn't work, when you go on the next generation architecture, you have always a fallback. And the idea is that we can also then do some in situ operations, which I'll talk about later. This is open source, and we get what I call good performance. I mean. We'd like to get better, but you know, we're always looking for better. But what we saw is we have this combustion code S3D, and it was writing, you know, typically they write about 1.9 megabytes per MPI process, that's say per core. They typically run on 96,000 cores. They have about 11 variables on average per writer, lots of different metadata. So we say, you know, this is getting actually pretty good performance. It's about 10 times better than what they were doing in their previous generation I.O. system. We have an astrophysics code where, you know, in one week they went from HDF5 over to Adios. They did all these things in HDF5 and they found actually we gave them a 10x performance improvement. So in general, what most people tend to see is that we get about a 10x performance improvement. And I'll explain a little bit about why. But you know, we just have you know, lots of good success cases. And again, you know, we do want our software easy to use because, I mean, unfortunately, I do work with certain people who will not understand most of our technology because they're busy with their own science. So what, what this is is about basically you know, in the S3D code. So this was using a popular technique called MPIO, and they were doing this thing called two-phase I.O., where you have a bunch of nodes collecting over to these other nodes, and then they write out. And this was done by another team, and this was the performance difference. And again, it's 30 gigabytes per second. What we found is actually the overhead that we gave this code from their last simulation, this is data they gave back to us, was about 0.6% of their time spent in I.O. So then we say, okay, you know, S3D, that, that's an easy one. We took an earthquake code, we worked with them, we got another, you know, very good performance number. 
But we said this is not good enough because what happens is that, again, it's this quality of service, it's this whole thing of variability. So what you basically we saw, and this was a paper we did the other year, was as you add more processors, you have more contention. You have contention from yourself, and then you also have contention from other users. And because you have all this contention when you're writing, you have to deal with it. So we did something which you would say, oh, that's pretty simple, you know. I mean, I don't know if a monkey can do it, but it was pretty simple in that, you know, we basically said, let's treat every single person or every single core writing, and we'll just queue them up. And we'll just say, if we have, for instance, um, 600 um, storage targets, you know, and then they have their rate set, so they're, say, 600 nodes for doing, you know, this I.O. business, what we'll do is we'll take two requests in, and then whenever, whenever you're done a request, you'll take another request. We'll keep tracking your metadata, and we'll write your metadata later. And we said, you know, what we can do is look at the standard deviation time, and instead of, like, going up, like, in this, like, really bad manner, we can keep it relatively constant, and we can get good performance. And in fact, what we saw was that, you know, when we do these methods for certain codes, we're getting about 60 gigabytes per second, which is about 50% of peak, and that's when the system is being busy. And that's without placement, because the APIs were not available for placement. So this is, this is really nice, and you know, we're trying to release that. But we found that, you know, unfortunately, people want to read sometimes. I don't really understand why, but they do want to read their data. And, you know, started talking to a lot of people at different locations. And I found this one NOAA lab, and they actually replicated their data four times. And the reason why they replicated their data is they had a uniform grid. So they had this I, J, K grid, and they were writing data out, let's just say, in another popular file format. I mean, well, I shouldn't mention it, but, you know, uh, you know if you know what climate does, you probably know what they would do. And the basic thing is that when they wanted to pull a plane, because the normal thing is, let me see a 2D plane from this 3D data set. Well, it's probably obvious, like, you know, if it was without time, there would be three different planes. And then there's time, so you can probably figure out why would they replicate four times. Because if you actually pulled out the wrong plane, it can be really poor performance. It could be, you want to read a 2D plane, go for lunch, when you're back, you may read it. Even though it's a few megabytes, it could be that bad. And we're trying to figure out, like, why are people doing this? So we said, well, you know, we have to be able to understand, you know, how to actually place data. And I'm sure you guys in this database community, you guys worry about this all the time. So we're worrying about our different types of patterns. And we said, oh my God, you know, this is really bad because we're finding a lot of people are suffering over this in our HPC world, which again, you guys are probably laughing about and saying we should just use a database. And perhaps, um, but you know, what we did was that we started to say, why is this occurring? So we put our little thinking cap on, and we said, okay, what's going on is that if you're doing things which are logically contiguous, when you're pulling these three different planes, this is the number of storage targets, so think of concurrency. The two things we worry about is concurrency and we worry about seeks. And if concurrency is like a big one, because you know when I have like lots and lots and lots of disk, the more concurrency I can get, the more performance. So what we started to do is look at a theoretical model and look at like the stripe count, which is you know in terms of your data, how many um, of these storage charges or, or disk rate sets are you across? And for one plane, you're like perfect. Another plane, there's times where you're not so great. And this is where, you know, go to lunch or go home and, you know, come back another day. And then when we said, well, what should we do? Well, the common thing that's being used is space phone curve. So we used a Hilbert curve. We laid out the data. So it's not laid out in memory. We just say, this process should write to this location, this storage target. This guy should write to this storage target. So we can place those. And then when we look at the actual performance on our Cray, what we saw was that our layout would have, and this is our small data, you, this would have uniform performance, but if we looked at logically contiguous, you would have this staircase effect, which again, this is in bandwidth and megabytes per second, and this is the, oh my God, I don't want this to ever occur, so let me replicate my data. So we said, okay, that's great. Well, what about for large data? So for large data, 
we did better, but then we had this big bump. So, you know, what happened is that we noticed that we're reading a lot of extra data. So one of the, um, one of the you know, latest research things we did was to say, okay, what if we just break that up? Everything of ours is broken into chunks, self-describing streams or self-describing chunks. Break up the large chunk to be smaller, and then we were able to actually get rid of that, which was very nice that we get rid of that. Well, the other thing that we worry about is that everyone says, you know, what's going on in the system? What will be the I.O. behavior for a particular code? And you can monitor things, you can do things to see. We said, well, we have this external XML file. And we have actually now, you know, a large number of applications for us. You know, maybe about 20 application teams working with us. Well, what if we had the system to automatically generate from this XML, which just says, I have these variables, and this, you know, this is how much data. You can generate an entire executable from the XML. Well, that's nice because application teams generally, they don't want to share their code, not their research code, so they can give you this other thing, and this is great. Well, there's this other thing of people saying, well, we have these I.O. kernels. Well, there's a page, you know, people keep pages of I.O. kernels, and the problem is that they're never kept to date because if you're running your research code and you're trying to do your science, the last thing you want to do when you're changing your code is to say, let me change this other code which mimics my behavior. It doesn't happen. And we saw that, you know, you can see things from 1999 of here's the big MPI codes for their I.O. performance. Well, of course, the codes don't do anything like that. And then they wonder, why are we putting this file system? And we saw that, you know, the performance with these common benchmarks are good. Why is everyone complaining? Well, you know, there's reasons. So we said, well, if we just take the XML file, we can get it. We did a comparison to, well, that looks horrible here. I don't know why, but whatever. But basically, we took a comparison of this other code. It's a fusion code, a gyrokinetic code. Not that important, but we said, well, how do we compare? And actually, within the um, variability of these codes, they're actually quite good. So we're finding that you know, without a, through a large variety of codes, given this suite of XML code, you can actually change. And because Adios has different ways to write, now you can actually cast all your different types of I.O., one file per process, different forms of aggregation strategies, and you can actually see. So if you're running a center, it's very easy for you to check all these different codes now. All right, SOA. So we have this whole philosophy that we need, we have huge amounts of complexity. So we said, you know, I.O. is a lot more than just writing to the file system for us. You know, it's how we get science done. The thing is, we have like these very large, complex teams. We're living in a world where we're collaborating with people from all over the world. They're developing different pieces of our code. In fact, we're in the multi-scale, multi-physics, so they're developing different codes. We're trying to put them together. And the platforms are changing. Everyone's changing. People are leaving the team. So I said, well, what if we start talking about this coupling? Coupling your visualization service to your main code. Coupling your analysis to your main code. But we just want them as separate, oh my god, okay. So we want to couple them all together, and we're going to deal with this complexity. And what we're going to do is stage. And what we'll do is we'll stage this, we'll, set, we'll schedule the data movement. We use RDMA to move the data. And we'll move data to an external location and from there over to your I.O. nodes. And for that, we found that in order to do that properly, you have to schedule. It's asynchronous. But your computation is doing communication also. You can't interfere with that because you're moving bulk data. And if you move your small data with your bulk data, you'll die. So we found with good scheduling systems, we can actually get, as you scale, this does not look good on here, but this was different number of core counts, you can get good performance. If you don't schedule, you'll find that actually using the staging approach, even though it may seem good, even though it may seem like you're getting huge bandwidth, your actual time for I.O. in terms of CPU seconds actually gets worse. So it's very important. So, okay, unfortunately I took all my time on things I shouldn't, but this is our new framework where we're trying to say that you want to be able to do 
you want to be able to plug in visualization, analysis, and really make it easy to do your science. And the main thing is that what, you, you know, what we have now is a way so that multiple executables, each one runs on a different set of processes, so they're separate executables, and through your I.O., now you're doing your end processors going to end processor, and you're doing lots of like gets and puts. You know, it's a publish describe type system. So this is great. We have high level of tolerance. If your Viz app crash, doesn't matter, it doesn't crash your real app. We were able to couple codes, couple multiple codes this way, which was really good using this um, type of shared space that we have. But now we're trying to make it so that developers can come in and they can plug in their analytics. And then when they want to come in and plug their analytics, we want to make it easy. But right now with our system, they would all have to run on separate staging cores. So we have to be able to schedule that and actually make an in-situ workflow to do that and then co-locate plugins. Well, now we're looking for the exascale when we have 1,000 cores per node or even more. Now we have to start taking pieces of an application, leave one where the application is, leave the other where the staging area is, and then what you're doing is that you're saying, where you don't move data, don't move data. And then when the data gets reduced, move the reduced data. So we're putting that together. But then another activity, now I'm rushing, is to try to actually move work to data. And we have two techniques to move work to data. One is actually embedding code in your data streams. It's self-describing, and then we can compile it. And we actually, it looks like C. It's a subset of C, and we can get pretty good performance, almost close to native C. The other way is actually breaking up your executable and then moving pieces of your executable around so that you're not moving these huge amounts of data. So we started to say, where do we put our different things? It's similar to like, you know, what can be map reduced, what can be like an iterative map reduced, what can be like, you know, a PGAS like environment. Where do you put the different pieces here? How do you divide it? What can be post processed? Well, in order to do this, you have to worry about things like how do I reduce your data? How do I compress the data? So one of my collaborators has been working with both lossy and lossless compression. It's very nice. I mean, I hate to do this because, you know, it's like here's the original. Here's the compressed. See, it looks the same. It must be the same. Okay. Now, if you're in any physics class, you'd probably fail it if you ever did that because you don't want to ever do that. You want to show the subtraction and you want to show not just this raw data. That's ridiculous because most of us actually process the data. So if I have long wavelengths, I might miss it. So we're trying to look at, for a lot of the common analysis, how does compression really affect it? Because just think, if I take different forms of derivatives, there might be things I miss. I mean, I could just really do a poor job. So we have to be very careful, but you know, it's like very important for us to reduce the data, so we're really looking into this. And then we're looking into multi-resolution techniques because, you know, again, I think there, were, you know, there was another talk the other day where, you know, it's great. You know, you want to be able to show a coarser view and a finer view. But if you don't have accurate representation, we find it really doesn't help. So we want to be able to say, we want to make sure that you can see a coarse level view that eventually you see enough of the effects that you say, I don't need to see the fine because I don't want to hit the file system. So reduce the amount of data movement. And if I have time for a talk, this is very simple, but it's basically not going to work on this PC. Okay, I'll, I'll describe it with, okay, now I'm in like PowerPoint hell, but um, I'll just tell you what that is before I get to conclusions. Basically, we launched a, a fusion code, or yeah, a fusion code. It was a 3D MHD code. It was on a thousand cores. That code, generally, what would it do? It would write a file. There would be another code which would read that file in. It would compute a bunch of derived quantities, so it would be a data expansion. Those things would be written out to disk. Then we would have a visualization program, either Paraview or Visit or whatever, but those were the two main ones. And then we could just now read those data, see the derived quantities, plot them, visualize it. And we said, well, if you, you know, with Adio, since we abstract I.O., you don't change your code. And now all of a sudden you just change your input parameters, say it's now going to be streaming. So we had you know, these things all running on different number of processors. So to the app, it just looks like I'm doing I.O., but you're doing all this end-to-end -end movement. So it's actually trying to make it easy. So that's, like, you know, that's a big part of like what we're trying to release you know, in the next six months, of how to make it so for anyone who wants to do this. Of course, it only works on um, systems that have RDMA. We haven't actually have a socket 
view of this because in our world, I mean, everyone has RDMA, right? I mean, who would actually buy a system without like at least something as poor as InfiniBand? I mean, if you go below, I, you know, we, we don't deal with that for what we call HPC because our calculations actually won't scale. But, you know, I understand it's a different world. So I'm not trying to knock it, it's a different world. So what we're saying is that, you know, we have this system, it's used by a lot of codes, it's um, very flexible, and you know, we're trying to get more users, and every time we get a new user, we seem to get more research questions. You know, and I think, you know, there's these AMR codes, there's these next generation things, we're thinking about energy movement, so, you know, it's a lot of fun, and Oak Ridge is a great place to work for those who are interested. Um, but basically, we have to reduce the amount of information going and coming from the file system, so we do need these types of in-transit, in-situ techniques, and that's a major focus of what we're trying to deliver for you know, now and for the exascale. So, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.